Hello and welcome to Toastmasters Live, where we can do both the Toastmaster roles and the behind the camera scenes. Today's theme is going to be State Fair. And I hope everybody is fond of the State Fair like I am, as I remember back in my childhood going with my parents and venturing to Machinery Hill and riding a space needle. Now, unlike most people, I got to ride a space needle multiple times throughout the State Fair because my dad was very good friends of the people who own the Space Needle. And so I got to go up probably six or seven times the day that we're there. Also, I had an uncle that used to show the machinery there up at the Machinery Hill, and I got to play on all the equipment and had fun with the tractors, the skid loaders, of the time which were way antique compared to what they are now. So I hope you have a enjoyable time at the State Fair if you go, and please do. The Thursday, the first Thursday of the State Fair, in fact, I will be there right across from Care 11's barn at the, what we call the Kirtu Trailer. Come visit me, I'll be there the whole day of the first Thursday of the opening. Now, I have a thought of the day that I normally do when I'm Toastmaster. My thought of the day is happiness is an attitude. We either make ourselves miserable or happy and strong. The amount of work is the same. That is Carlos Castanda who said that statement. Let me call up our general evaluator, Teresa, and let her have her introduce her team to you for the rest of the meeting. everybody. I'm the general evaluator today and in a Toastmaster meeting we have helpers so we can learn and speak better and get evaluations. My first helper is a speech evaluator. Number one will be Sarah Carcello. Thank you. My name is Sarah Carcello. I will be the speech evaluator evaluating the speech for Vasa Zani, who will be presenting a speech from the Competent Communicator Manual, project number eight, getting comfortable with visual aids. The objective of the speech will be to essentially get comfortable with using visual aids. He will select his visual aids based on his audience. And by knowing his audience, he will use the visual aids to share what his topic is. And the speech is called Scared of the Unknown. I'm very excited to learn what he's going to be sharing with us and see what visual aids he will be using with the speech today. Thank you. The next helper I have is another speech evaluator. This is Dan Nelson. Thank you, Madam General Evaluator. I will be evaluating Sue Thomas's speech tonight. She'll be working on project number four from the Competent Communicator. 
how to say it. Sue's speech is entitled, A Single Spoon. The objectives of this speech is to select the right words and sentence structure to communicate her ideas clearly, accurately, and vividly, and use rhetorical devices to enhance and emphasize ideas, and finally, to eliminate jargon and unnecessary words, and of course, to use correct grammar. The time for this will be five to seven minutes. My next helper is the grammarian, and that is Don Matthews. I am the grammarian tonight, and my primary job is to look for good and poor uses of the English language. I will also be looking for ahs, ums, and other distractors that we use during, with our speaking. I will also be checking to see how many times the word of the day is used. And today, our word of the day is prognosticate. It is to predict according to present indications or signs, to foretell. An example would be, the armchair quarterback tried to prognosticate the play from his recliner. Another use of this word could be used as, I prognosticate that many of poor grammatical uses of the language will be edited and put into our blooper reel. Madam Toastmaster. Okay. It's okay. Our last helper is our timer, and that will be done with Sher Sherry Jacobson. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sherry Jacobson. I'm your timer for today. My role is to time the speeches and the evaluators. In Toastmasters, not only do we learn how to speak in public, but we also learn to keep within a certain time frame. And my job will be to make sure that everyone stays within their allotted time. Thank you. Now it's time for me to relinquish control of the lectern to our Toastmaster today, Rick Landness. Hello again. Thank you very much, Teresa, for your team. We're now here for our speeches. Our first speech will be a 10 to 12 minute speech it will be from the Project 8 manual, Getting Comfortable with Visual Aids. Our speaker will be Vasif, and he'll talk about the how we are scared of a lot of things. And he'll help us understand the pros and cons of being scared. Vasif. I'm going to start by asking you two questions. What are you scared of and why? Mr. Toastmasters, fellow members, very welcome guests, and the viewership of North Metro TV. Human beings are good at a lot of things, adaptability, creativity, and survival. But there's something that they're not very good at, assessing risk, which is why we tend to most fear the things that are least likely to happen to us and vice versa. Now, there are three types of mistakes that we do which severely limits our ability to assess risks, and I'm going to explain all three of those. The first is what I call a knee-jerk reaction, which means that something bad happens and human beings 
automatically start fearing that very quickly and try to avoid those situations. For example, when the terrorist attacks happened in Florida and Club Pulse, there was a recorded study that people stopped leaving their houses except for going to work and even started getting their groceries shipped, shipped to their place so that they don't have to go out. Now, the likelihood of you being attacked by a terrorist is less than you being hit by lightning twice. But because of the knee-jerk reaction, people did not want to leave their houses. The second is called cumulative risk, which means that we tend to overreact to dangers which we perceive are immediate and tend to ignore things that happen over the long term. For example, we try to, we keep on washing our hands like a maniac so that we don't touch germs or contract a flu, but we use the same clean hands to eat two extra cupcakes after dinner, even when we are obese and we are not supposed to have those, because diabetes happens over a long term, but flu happens immediately, even though diabetes is a much more serious condition than flu, but it happens over a lifetime, and that's why people tend to ignore that risk. The third thing will be the illusion of control, the risk that we think that we are avoiding by being in control, which an example of that is something that happened after 9-1-1, when 1.4 million people started developing the fear of flying, and they decided that they will drive to their vacations instead, because they thought that driving is in their control as opposed to flying. That year, there were 2,000 extra fatalities on, caused, by road, caused by car accidents because there were more people driving uh, to their vacations. And that is because people think that if they're in control, that the risk will be minimized. Now, if you look at all the phobias globally, you will see one very common trend that there is not really a rational reason for having that phobia because of two reasons. One, it's very less likely that it'll actually happen to you. And second, even if it does happen to you, it won't hurt you. Today, what I will do is dispel one of the most common phobias that people have, arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. I will divert your attention to the slides that we have. I want to right away tell you that the fear of spiders ir is irrational for two reasons. One, it's very less likely that spiders will bite you. Secondly, even if they do bite you, they won't hurt you, right? So let's look at the first, first reason, very less likely to happen. What is the likelihood that you'll actually ever get bitten by a spider? First of all, when people say I got bit by a spider, 80% of the times they've actually been bitten by something else some other insect or bug, but not spiders. But if you want to do the math, there are 3,000 3, species of spiders in the US, out of which only 2% of the species, that means 60 species, cause medically significant bites, which means there is at least a little bit of pain when they actually bite you. 58 out of those 60 species, when they bite you, it's less painful than a bee sting. And the two species that bite you, we don't need to worry about them too much for three reasons. One, one, they're extremely rare in the upper Midwest, so we don't need to worry about it. Secondly, both of those species are very shy and timid and non-aggressive. They want to stay away from places where there's a lot of public activity. And they only bite you when you threaten them or corner them or play with them. I've actually been bitten by a black, spider, black widow spider during my PhD and I'm still alive. So even if they do bite you, it doesn't hurt you that much. Now the second reason is that even if they do bite you, like I said, it's not going to hurt you much, but we need to avoid those situations. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of things that'll help you avoid situations of spider bites that can be poisonous. The two spiders in the United States that, can, that inject venom when they bite you, the first is the black widow spider. The way to recognize a black widow spider is the hourglass, the red hourglass on its abdomen that you can see on the slides. If they ever bite you, the bites are two tiny puncture marks and they're immediately painful. So you would, you would feel it right away and the pain intensifies for a couple of hours and then subsides after 12 hours. And if you go to a doctor, they, they, there's a commercial antidote available that will cure it right away. 
So that's the black widow spider. The other species of spider that can be venomous is the brown recluse. The way to recognize a brown recluse spider is by its body that's violin shaped. The bites are painful, so it is sneaky. But there is localized burning in that area where they bite you for the next one to 12 hours. And then there's a small pimple that form and the surrounding tissue gets dark. Also, there, like I said, for black widow, even these spiders have a commercial cure. So if you go to the doctor, you will get cured immediately. So I'm hoping that with these two facts, the fact that it's less likely to happen to you and the fact that even if it does happen, it's not going to hurt you much, it'll ease some of that fear that people have towards spiders. Now, when we are scared of something, we try to avoid it at, at all costs. But in this case of spiders, we are missing a big chance, a lot of opportunities to actually be inspired by spiders and develop new materials and processes that can help a lot of industries worldwide. And this is what brings me to my second part here, why we should be inspired by spiders. And there are multiple reasons. I'm only going to talk about two reasons. One is that you can form the next generation of smart materials that are made by processes that are sustainable. You're not using coal energy or any other form of processing that hurts our environment or creates more global warming because we know that we have enough of that going on already. Second is that we have, when you look at spiders, they are very clever at hunting their prey. And we can learn quite a bit from their different strategies that spiders use to hunt their prey. So I'm gonna start with quickly with the first one, which is how can we learn to develop next generation materials using spiders? If you look at the web on the screen, this is the most common kind of spider web that you will see in Minnesota. It's called an orb web, it looks like an orb. Right in this picture, I can tell you that there are four different kinds of silk threads used to construct this architecture. The ones that are going radially outwards is one. The ones that are going in spiral is the sticky silk that spiders use to capture their prey. There's one silk that attaches the web to the trees. That's called a piriform silk. And then there's one silk that ties the knot between the radial silk and the capture silk. So there are four different kinds of silk in that one. How do spiders make these threads? Now, if you look at the abdomen of spiders, you will see that there are a lot of different glands on the abdomen and it takes silk out from a different gland and then it goes and forms the web piece by piece using that particular kind of silk only because all of these kind of silks are very different. You maybe are not able to very clearly see the glands here. So I have another prop here, a spider in my hand that'll help you to see the glands much more clearly than the picture here, and I'm going to pass that around. Thank you. So if you see the, the prop that I just sent around, there are eight glands that create different kinds of silk, and they can spin all those silks and use it for different purposes, like prey capture, like locomotion, et cetera. Now, the silk that is going radially outside is, is in strictly engineering terms, the toughest material on Earth. It is tougher than stainless steel of the same weight. We did some research in my PhD where we actually formed a muscle that if, if you form a muscle that's as thick as my finger, it can lift an entire truck, uh, an 18-wheeler. And it is used, when spiders spin this thread, they use only water as a processing tool. So it's not, hurting the environment when you make these things. So it's a very sustainable process, and you're making a, very f uh, a material that is very smart and very tough. Now, the second thing why we need to be inspired by spiders is their clever prey capturing strategies. And I'm gonna quickly show you a video that will that was on NPR that tells you why it's a why it's a very clever strategy. I don't know if you can hear it. So what spiders are doing, this is a schematic of the spider actually building a web. And what they do is they tune the different parts of a web like a guitar string. And what it does essentially, why it's tuning is because so that it can control the tension in these threads. 
And if there is a prey that gets stuck in the web, it can send vibrations to the center of the web where the spiders are. And you can figure out not only the location of the prey, but also the kind of prey. So it can tune, like you can see now, it's tuning all those radial threads. And then it forms the sticky threads in the spiral fashion. And then the spider stays at the center. All the different threads here, so let's say if an insect gets stuck here, the spider can sense its position using the vibration. And if it can figure out the position and also the kind of insect that it has, um, that it has captured. Also, if it is a potential mate for the spiders, that also can be found out by just a different type of vibration. So it's a very intelligent design of there's a sticky thread, there's a stiff thread, there's a softer thread that breaks the motion, there's one thread that sends vibrations. And using all these clever materials, spiders can actually do eat their dinner every night. The second strategy, which is one of my favorite strategies here, is of a cowboy spider. Now this spider doesn't really spin a web, but what it does have is a glue drop at the end of just one thread. And this spider mostly attacks female moths. And what it would do is it'll spin the glue drop like a cowboy spinning the lasso and go and target the female moth and it'll just capture it. So it, it, it's not using as much silk, but it's just, it's doing the same business in that it attacks and captures prey every day. Again, a very clever design. Also because the moth's bodies are hydrophobic and these glue drops are water-based. So it's a very interesting question of how something which is hydrophilic can attach to something that is hydrophobic. Another question for science, engineering, and for other industries. Now, because we are scared of spiders, we do not study spiders, we avoid spiders, and we hence forego a lot of opportunities to, to make significant contributions to different industries, like defense, like biomedicine, industrial, automotive, et cetera, because we are not developing new products, we are not developing new technologies for these industries. And this fear of spiders is because we cannot assess its risk. Now here, I have told you why spider bites should not be feared, and I prognosticate that using this framework that I have told you, you should be able to ease your fear or overcome some of the other phobias you have to, including the fear of public speaking, glossophobia. Because we have so much fear of public speaking, it's one of the most common fears globally, we avoid situations in which we have to talk to talk in public or talk at all, which means we are going, foregoing a lot of opportunities to inspire, to inform, to educate, and to motivate people and bring out the best in them. Here at Toastmasters, we learn about public speaking, we assess its risks to us, which are none, and we overcome it every day by facing them. And I encourage you to follow this three-step framework for all of your other phobias. You learn why you're scared of it, you assess its risk and likelihood of that happening, and then you go and try to face it. I'm not asking you to go and stick your head in the mouth of an alligator, because that'll definitely kill you. But for most of your other phobias, you need to understand why are you scared of them. So let me end this by asking you the same two questions. What are you scared of and why? Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Vasil, for that very insightful and interesting speech about spiders. As I now have a more clear understanding that they have three different webs, not just the one that I thought they did when they spun them. Our next speaker for today is Sue Thompson, or Thomas. Here we do. Our next speaker is Sue Thomas. She's going to lead you down the, one of the paths of her life journey. She will speak within the guidelines of Project 4, How to Say It, from the CC manual. And over the next five to seven minutes, 
She hopes to use her language to convince you that sometimes what seems like the smallest decision may be the most important one. Her presentation is titled, A Single Spoon. Sue Thomas, A Single Spoon. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and viewers of North Metro TV, I'm going to tell you a story of a single spoon and its surprising impact on my life. In 2016, in the wake of a divorce and the death of my mother, I was on a journey to rediscover myself. As part of my journey, I committed to a year of saying yes. If you haven't heard of that year, in a nutshell, it involves committing to saying yes to things that make you uncomfortable. For me, it was a bit like hopping in a canoe without paddles and without a plan and just letting myself go for the year. And I knew I had to hang on. So a couple months into my year of yes, with many yeses under my belt, a friend asked me if I was interested in going to the art of world with her. Now this might seem like a simple thing, but at this point in my life, my comfort zone for the weekends was staying home, doing yard work, going grocery shopping, and doing the cooking. I was very solitary and was keeping to myself, to the point where my neighbors had even told me I needed to do more than just take care of my yard. So this was very outside of my comfort zone, but this was my year, so I said yes. My friend and I decided to limit our art of world expedition to the Caskets Arts Building, which is just blocks from her house. We knew it was a huge building, and we could spend hours and probably not see everything there, but yet somehow I knew inside that building I was going to find something I was meant to find. And I shared that with my friend, and we started guessing what that might be. She knows me pretty well. So we both kind of thought, because I was redoing my house and trying to get in my mind what I wanted it to look like after the divorce, maybe it's going to be a painting or a sculpture that's going to give the tone for the whole house. So we kind of started in those areas when we were walking through the Casket Art Building. And she patiently explored with me, pointed out things she thought might be it, but I wasn't finding the right thing. We continued to search studio after studio and floor after floor. We saw glass, metals, sculptures, paintings, drawings, photography, textiles, jewelry. It was beautiful. Some of it was incredibly moving, but I hadn't found it. Go. Something changed when I walked into the wood arts area. I was mesmerized by the beauty of the woodwork. The colors, the grains, and textures pulled me in. Looking was no longer enough for me in this room. I had to experience the wood. I started touching everything. The tables, the chairs, the bowls. I reached a workspace of a woman named Teresa Audet. She had a beautiful display of cutting boards. I picked up each cutting board. I felt the curves. I admired the grain. I looked at the finish. I thought, this might be it. I can picture these in my kitchen. Then I saw her spoons. They were gorgeous. Somehow they were rustic and refined all at the same time. I knew I had to sample these spoons, so I started picking them up. And a bit like Goldilocks, I knew when I'd found the one that was just right, the minute I had it in my hand. I knew I had to have that spoon. I normally am a frugal person, and yet I knew paying $62 for this spoon was a bargain because it somehow felt like I was investing in myself. Allowing myself to have this spoon was affirming that I was worthy of something special, and I hadn't believed that for a long time. I bought it without hesitation. And I spent some time talking with Teresa about her carving process. She told me how important it was to work with the natural grain of a piece of wood, and that if you fight the natural grain, you may still be able to make a spoon the spoon might even be useful and beautiful, but it's going to be weak. I also learned that knots in the wood are imperfections caused by trauma to the tree. In healing itself, the grain weaves its way around the wound and creates something beautiful. In addition to these actual carving techniques, here's something else I took away. Each spoon is there in the piece of wood, waiting for the artist to see it and bring it out and the wood will tell you what it wants to become, but only if you take the time to listen. 
I couldn't help but draw some parallels to my own life. So I realized I'm the artist responsible for discovering the spoon hidden inside of me. It's always been there. I wasn't listening. I had tried to carve myself into something that was in conflict with my natural grain. I was determined to make myself into what I thought my perfect spoon should look like. And I was ignoring everything in me that said, this is not the way I want to be carved. I probably looked okay on the surface, but eventually broke. Once I really started to listen, so many new and wonderful things became a part of my life. One thing I realized, surprisingly, was that I have a strong interest in wood. I had just hadn't ever tried it yet. I took classes using power tools and made a picture frame, a footstool, and a side table. I felt empowered, and I loved it. I now have the start of a pretty decent workshop at my house, and I'm making things out of wood for myself. In fact, one of my scraps is now a cutting board. It's not as good as Teresa's, but I'm getting there. Um, about a year after finding the spoon, I started, I came full circle, and I took a class on spoon carving. I brought my dad along. It was his Father's Day present. So we had such a wonderful experience. We both did. And I bought the tools to do spoon carving right then and there, and I knew I was going to become a spoon carver. I had the materials all over my yard. I used to think of them as trash. Now I see them as spoons and maybe bowls. I have big dreams. So day by day, branch by branch, and spoon by spoon, my listening is improving. And today I know that I'm working with my own natural grain, I feel strong and resilient. I'm learning to appreciate the hard-earned knots and even my age rings. I have reached a place where I take the time daily to listen, to do a bit of carving and shaping, and continue the work of discovering my own inner spoon, all because I invested in a single spoon and myself. Thank you, Sue, for that very inspirational and very thought-provoking message about how to rediscover yourself, even as adults. Everybody thinks that we start stop growing when we become 21 or 18, but it's always evolving, and we should never stop learning and growing within ourselves. Our next portion of our meeting will be table topics, which Sherry Jacobson will be doing. And her table topics theme is State Fair. Will be very thought provoking in that our three answers to the questions, the three people that will be answering the questions, will have a, a very thoughtful answer to your questions. Sherry. Hi everybody, it's time for Table Topics. Table Topics gives our members an opportunity to speak off the cuff. Every day we are presented with opportunities when people ask us questions that we have to come up with an immediate answer. Table Topics also prepares us for things like job interviews. Today, the theme is the State Fair. The State Fair is almost upon us. The State Fair begins August 24th and runs until September 4th. This is a very popular event, especially for us in the cities. The average daily attendance is about 180,000 people a day. This is over three times the daily attendance at Walt Disney World. It is the largest state fair in the United States by daily average attendance. Every year, 145 tons of potatoes are made into French fries. Nearly half a million sticks will be made into corn dogs and pronto pups. 2.6 million cheese curds and 4 million 
of those little delicious donuts will be sold. Each year, new foods are introduced. This year, some of the new foods on the list are duck bacon wontons, deep fried avocados, and the cheesy nacho corn on the cob. I'm not an adventurer when it comes to eating new foods. My favorite food at the fair is the ice cream from the dairy barn and the turkey sandwich. Dawn, do you have a favorite food? Are you one of those daring people that likes to try the new foods? Madam Table Topics Master, my favorite food or actually, am I adventurous? Do I like to try different foods at the state fair? Actually, no, I've got a few favorites. I actually have a state fair routine that I like to do. When I go to the state fair, the first place I like to go is at the Kiwanis Malt Shop and get the strawberry malt. That's my absolute favorite. So I get that first no matter what time of day I go. And then I like to go straight over to pet surgery and eat the malt while they cut open an animal and perform surgery on the animal. It's actually very humane. I mean, not to eat and watch, but the surgery is anyway. And then after that, I like to go to Aunt Martha's cook or Sweet Martha's Cookies and get a big pile of cookies, a big tub. And I go right over to the milk barn and I eat milk and cookies. And I will sit there for at least a half an hour and I will tell stories to anybody who will listen to anything I have to say because I just like to talk. But that's generally my state fair routine and my favorite foods at the fair. Madam Table Topics Master. Thank you for that answer. <laughs> Did you know that about 200 animals are born each state fair season? During the fair, nearly 20,000 animals are housed and 4,500 tons of manure is hauled out. A side note, this manure is taken to Hastings, Minnesota, where it is composted, mixed with dirt, and used as a fertilizer on more than 1,000 acres of farm. Teresa, do you visit the, the animal barns? And which of, your anim which of the animals are your favorite? Madam Table Topics Master, nice question. I don't go to the barns. I avoid the barns. I'm not much into wanting to be around the animals and just seeing the animals. I did go to it more often because I had a friend that actually worked the barns. So I was there to uh, check in with her. But I'm one that mostly goes to the music events, especially the free ones, to check it out. I like to walk around on the shopping areas. And I don't always go every year. I'm one that goes when I have somebody to go with, and I'll go. But it's usually for the shopping and an uh, act I want to see. And that's the reason I go to the state fair, just to hang out and find some friends to hang out. So I don't really do a lot of the barn stuff because... I don't need to see the animals and, and smell the smells. <laughs> Madam Table Topics Master. Thank you, Teresa. More than 8,000 items are entered into the Creative Activities Competition. The most popular pie is apple pie. I have entered my grandmother's banana nut bread, but I didn't place. But I did enter a sewing project, and I won a first place ribbon. Sarah, have you or anyone you've known entered in the competition? Or do you visit the activity center? Thank you for that fantastic question, Madam Table Topics Master. Have I or anyone that I know or even considered entering anything in the activities contests? N no, to all of the above. <laughs> but I do go into those barns all of the time. My first, the f anytime I go to the state fair, I go into this to look at the seed entries, to look at the seed art, because I always want to see what 
pop culture that year what's going on and it's always something political usually related to presidential whatever and i'm so excited this year to see what's going on with the pl current political storm and i'm pretty sure it's going to be something related to president trump i've seen my favorite has been michelle bachman just the fun things that people have did in the past with her and I cannot do anything seed art related, but it's just so crazy and awesome to see what people can do with just a fine, teeny, tiny little pieces of seed. Just fascinating. Pie, I can barely make a pie myself. Banana bread is about the extent of what I can do because I always have leftover bananas on the counter and I throw them in the freezer and if I'm crazy, I'm always crazy, but I'll make banana bread on a whim all the time, but will I enter it in the state fair? Absolutely not. <laughs> I won't even share it with anyone. But I aspire to maybe someday in my ancient age <laughs> to enter something in the state fair activities. I always walk through just to get inspired because it's greater than Pinterest. Honestly, if you want to get inspired, or excited about something fun that you could do someday. Photography, if you're into photography, think about entering something in the State Fair because it would be fantastic to see what anyone could do. It's amazing, I swear. Do it, go, try, be it, activities, enter. Back to you. Thank you. Well done. Okay. You should really try to get out to the State Fair. Experience the concerts, the animals, the creative activities, the food, everything the State Fair has to offer. And if you take the bus and you're going through the West main gate where the buses go through, stop at the info booth, talk to my husband, he's the old man, and try to stump him. I guarantee you won't be able to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sherry, and the guest speakers for sharing your insightful news about the State Fair and what we have to look for and what you've seen or don't like to see. Our next portion of the meeting is to do the evaluation. And with that, Teresa and her team will come up and evaluate what we've done tonight. Teresa? Thank you, Rick. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have our first speech evaluator come up and do the speech evaluation. Please welcome Sarah Carcello. Thank you. My evaluation today is on Vasov's speech, Scared of the Unknown. He presented a very enlightening speech today on fears. What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid of? He started his speech on a very intriguing tone. I sat there thinking, really? Really? What am I afraid of? Why am I afraid of these things? Where is he going with this? I really liked how you got us going, Vasov. Then he went into different types of risks. These, these types of risks were new to me. 
Now, there were no slides to explain these things, and I know the project is based on visual aids. I was waiting, wondering, thinking, are you forgetting to click what's going on here? But you didn't click. And then I really realized that this was your intro. And I think it would have been really beneficial if you could have had a couple slides explaining those things. There were adaptability, survival, assessing risks, cumulative risks, illusion control, kind of deep things. Maybe I'm the only one that thought those things, but it would have been helpful if you could have teased those out more. And then more so as the presentation went on, if you could have tied those back into the rest of the PowerPoint, the rest of the, the concept of what you were talking about. You talked about the likelihood of spider bites. Why be, spider, <laughs> why be inspired of spiders about spiders? All of those are very interesting concepts. And I wasn't quite sure how the risks and all of those things came together, but it was all so interesting. Talking about the visual aids, this was the whole point of the presentation. The slides were fantastic. You use black text on white background. Very easy to see. Very easy for all of us in the audience to see the slides. There were a couple slides that had too much text that could have been very easily pulled out, been pulled out. You are very knowledgeable on your content. You are very confident in the way you presented the materials. You used gestures appropriately. You spoke very confidently in terms of how you were presenting the materials. You had perfect points on the materials. And you had great word use. At the end of the speech, your conclusion had a fantastic call to action in terms of how you could use the what, the whys, what you were most afraid of in terms of the parallel to Toastmasters. Use these same risk controls to be better or to get more involved in Toastmasters. All of these fantastic things came together in the end. And I think that in and of itself could be a speech. Take that and have another speech in that very same concept and get people to think of spiders and also think of Toastmasters and don't be afraid of any of that. And do Toastmasters. Now I'm going to look at a spider and think, Toastmasters! <laughs> Such a great concept. And I liked how you used the word of the day and the conclusion. Great job on that because I don't think I even used it and I'm not even going to try. Great speech, Vasav. I really enjoyed it, and the PowerPoint was fantastic, fantastic video, how we couldn't hear the video, but you walked us through it with your words and your visual description. I liked it, and you did a great job filling in on that deficit in that area. Fantastic speech. Thank you for sharing that with us. I appreciate it. Back to you. Thank you, Sarah. Our next evaluator is Dan Nelson. Thank you, Madam Dolly Evaluator. Sue, I want to start out by saying I prognosticate that this speech will be an example of how to do project number four. I thought you did a wonderful job of providing great, uh, vivid, specific, and used a lot of rhetorical devices. As far as some of the specific language, I like when you talked about things like the, some of your experiences where you're going through the, 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 the different places as far as cutting boards and curves and finishes and grains. Again, those are very specific words in terms of got, it got us into the, the moment. Basically, this story, it was basically a one story where you started out and it kind of built up. And I liked the way it really built up because it was, it was 
kind of exciting to see well, where we're going to go, where, where, how is this going to end, and you discovering in terms of what it was that exactly that you that made you passionate. The other thing is you used vivid words. You said things like, I felt empowered. You also uh, described the spoons as gorgeous and rustic and refined. So again, those are nice, vivid words that you use. So I thought you did a great job with that. But the best thing, I guess, was, was the re rhetorical devices. You used numerous rhetorical devices throughout the speech. And I think it was wonderful. Some of the examples are words will tell you. Some examples are getting outside your comfort zone. My own inner spoon, a metaphor. Like Goldilocks, a simile. You use a lot of alliteration, things like weaves and weaves around the wound, and other words like that. So overall, I felt that this was a very excellent speech. I, uh, language was just outstanding. A couple, one thing I, I will say though, in terms of the way you started the speech, you talked about. I'm going to tell you a story. I recommend that you don't say, I'm going to tell you a story. Just get into the story. G pull us in. Imagine. You know, pull us into the story and get us going right away. I think it would have been more effective to start at the beginning that way. So that's the only thing I could really recommend in terms of making a difference on that. But overall, I, I just love the language. I love the vulnerability that you showed throughout the speech. It, it made it even more impactful, believe it or not. And I look forward to hearing future speeches from you. Madam General Bedway. Thank you, Dan. We're now going to get our grammarian's report from Don Matthews. somewhere. The grammarian report tonight, I will say that for everybody who spoke tonight, it made my job very difficult because it's very hard to catch items that are not proper in, gra in grammar, but I did get a few. The word of the day was used by Vasov and by Dan Nelson. As far as ums and ahs, there weren't very many. I would say that most of them, if any, would probably be edited out. But, <laughs> but the, let's see, we had uh, Sue, you had one um that I counted. Rick, in your Toastmastering, you had two that I saw, heard. And Dan, there was just one. And that was all I caught up today. I will mention on a good use of the English language, I, something did catch my interest on Vasov. He said he was bitten by a black widow spider during his PhD, and he turned out OK. Now, was that because of the black widow spider or because of the PhD? I don't know. But anyway, Vasov, I'm really glad you're OK. Madam General Evaluator. Thank you, Don. Now we're going to get a timer's report from Sherry. Vasav, your speech was 14 minutes and 40 seconds. Your goal was to stay within 10 to 12 minutes. Sue, your goal was 5 to 7 minutes, and you came in at 6 minutes and 57 seconds. Sarah, your evaluation should have been between two and three minutes, and it was four minutes and 10 seconds. Don, your evaluation came in at two minutes and 39 seconds. Table topics. The people answering the question has one to two minutes to speak. Don, you came in at one minute and 13 seconds. Teresa, you came in at 56 seconds. 
And Sarah, you were at two minutes and 18 seconds. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Now, this is the point where I get to do an evaluation of what happened during the meeting. There was a few items I want to just give note to. We could hear the tech team, even though you're in the room. There, has, there was a few times we could actually hear you in this room. I noticed sometimes with the speaker, when we're switching from camera to camera, we need to let the person know, but realize the speaker doesn't have to move their head to the camera if they don't want to. So you can at least give them a heads up that the camera's switching, but that's really up to the speaker if they want to pause and then turn to the other camera. And it's nice to do it on pauses. So there was a couple times when I saw George give the signal and you guys switch the cameras perfectly on a pause, which makes it a little easier for the speaker. Other items during the speech was that our evaluators did good get give us good evaluations. They gave us items to work on and what their strengths and what was good for what they were doing. Now I'm going to return the lectern to our Toastmaster, Rick Landis. Thank you very much, Teresa, and your team for doing an excellent job. Please, everybody in the North Metro TV land, come visit us. We'd love to have visitors. You do not need to participate in the meeting like Sarah did. She's a guest today, but she decided to come out of her comfort zone and join us in front of the camera. So with that, thank you everybody for being here and I look forward to having our next meeting in two weeks on August 22nd. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you all. Good night.